Ladies and gentlemen, with no further ado, I'm proud to introduce Antonia Bea of uh, Bea Solutions. Uh, the, you're a principal cloud engineer, which means you're all fluffy and sorry. I'm gonna explain. Perfect. Um, thank you everyone for coming. Uh, presentation's gonna be a little odd. I was originally planning on demoing in AWS. Uh, something happened and that's no longer happening, so I'm gonna be demoing locally. Uh, so I had to make some quick changes at the end, uh, but I think I have something that's worth showing. Um, just give an overview of the presentation. We're gonna start off with an introduction. We're gonna do a quick welcome to Jenkins. Then we're gonna do a deep dive and then a demo and questions. So um, if there's anything that you have questions about during the presentation, feel free to ask. Uh, not really formal about this. Uh, the presentation's just here to make sure that I stay on track, so. All right, so let's talk about who I am. Um, we just mentioned I am a cloud engineer, which I believe means I'm a software engineer focused on cloud technologies, and I have a specialization in automation. That's primarily where I made uh, my career. I uh, spent most of my time in the retail industry. I uh, spent a lot of time at Best Buy. Uh, I was there for about nine years. I was in multiple positions there. Started out as a cashier, seasonal. Moved over to Geek Squad. Went over to GeekSquad.com. Uh, did some web development there, moved over to BestBuy.com, did some more development there, some operations, uh, moved over to a automation team and did a lot of development. After that, I joined SPS Commerce. Yep. Woo, woo. <laughs> <laughs> the team is right here. Uh, so I was the lead cloud engineer there, uh, primarily focused on building out uh, the AWS environment. And uh, as I was leaving, working on a disaster recovery project, which I'm sure is still ongoing. <laughs> I am currently at Target. I am an independent consultant on the cloud platform engineering team. I spend most of my time and days right now on Jenkins, which pretty much means that I deal with lots of different teams, lots of different people trying to get their solutions into Jenkins. Um, it's kind of just a place that uh, stuff runs. Um, the other thing is I'm a longtime Jenkins user. I've used Jenkins for almost as long as it's been out. It, it came out around 2011 um, when it was forked from Hudson, um, and I've been using it pretty much since then. I want to talk a little bit about what the presentation's about. Um, I know it's a little vague, uh, real world Jenkins, what does that actually mean? Uh, so what I actually want to talk about is best practices, some uh, common pitfalls, how do you administer Jenkins, uh, what does monitoring and scaling a Jenkins cluster look like, and then I want to take a quick deep dive into the Jenkins ecosystem. So how the community works, just talk about how uh, the Jenkins uh, environment is. I also want to say what this is not about. Um, so we'll not be doing any code deep dives. If you wanted to know how extension points work or stapler or how to do plugin development, that is not this talk. Um, if you want one of those talks, I certainly can do that, um, but this is not uh, the goal of this one. I am also not focusing on specific automation tools. Um, I want the focus to be squarely on Jenkins. So I intentionally left out stuff like Chef Puppet, Ansible, any of those things that uh, kind of can distract. I want to focus on the principles, on what it would take to actually uh, stand up a Jenkins cluster. And a lot of the reason for that is um, when you go back to your environment, how you build it is going to be completely different than the way I build it. So I don't want um, it to be I don't want the idea to be distracted by the specifics of the configuration tools. I'm also not focusing on any specific cloud platforms. Um, AWS um, is the one I have the most experience with, uh, GCP. Um, we definitely will not be talking about Azure um, <laughs> or Windows, um, but it at least gets an honorable mention. All right, so uh, presentation started. Um, this is Jenkins. Um, this is the main entry screen. Getting queued to move over. This uh, screenshot was actually just taken a couple days ago on the most recent, well, almost the most recent version. This is version 224 of Jenkins. It's kind of went through a lot of changes, but this is what you get. You start it up, this is what you get. So let's talk a little bit about what is Jenkins. 
Um, according to Jenkins.io, um, Jenkins is the leading open source automation server. Jenkins provides hundreds of plugins for building, deploying, and automating any project. Um, according to me, I just feel that it's a mature, a mature platform that allows you to get stuff done. Um, usually there's a place where it's running, you can put your jobs there and have it automated. So some of the use cases for Jenkins. Uh, the most common one is using it as a build server. Um, as a build server, all that means is you're checking out code, building it, running some tests, and reporting feedback. Sometimes it ends with uploading it, uh, but most of the time it ends there. Uh, another, com <laughs> another common use case is a CI CD server. Um, checking out code from SCM, building the pieces, running the tests, um, reporting feedback, but this goes a little bit further and actually will spin up an environment with that uh, completed code. Um, this is where Jenkins is trying to go, um, and you can see that from some of the plugins that they're creating now. They're shipped the pipeline, which we're going to talk about a little bit later. Um, another big um, use case for Jenkins is a cron or battery placement. So it's very easy to put a job out there, put out a timer and say run this job at, on this given interval, on this given date. It has built-in mechanisms for that. And one of the best features of it is that it's visible. Um, so one of the uh, main issues with cron is um, when you run in on a system, it's there, nobody knows it's there, it runs, sends emails to itself, and nobody ever sees it. <laughs> um, my favorite piece of Jenkins, my use case for it is actually to eliminate people's excuses. Um, so Jenkins is unbiased, it doesn't care. It doesn't care what you did, it will um, give you either a red or green, um, depending on your plugin set. Um, it's unbiased and it accepts new work. You can throw anything at it and it will take it. Doesn't care. Some other key information about Jenkins is that it's written in Java, um, but it's also heavily tied to Groovy. So a lot of the stuff you're gonna see in, as far as Jenkins is going to be configured via Groovy um, because it all runs on the JVM. Um, all of the core stuff for Jenkins is still uh, primarily Java. Some of the plugins uh, from companies like JFrog, the makers of Artifactory, they're big Groovy shops. Uh, so they publish a lot of plugins that are actually written in Groovy. There's nothing stopping you from writing a plugin in Java or Groovy or JRuby. It just has to run on the JVM. So the other piece I want to talk about is the communication model. Uh, so Jenkins um, can be set up as a distributed process. Um, you can break it up into, uh, it, into different nodes. It follows a master agent model. Um, so there's a couple different ways that can work. So for a master agent model, um, you can either have uh, the master connecting down to the agents. That's the default behavior of Jenkins. Um, and they use uh, JNLP, um, which just is a protocol that uh, is in Java that lets uh, remote systems talk using RPC. Um, Another option is the master can connect to the agent over SSH. Um, there's a plugin for that. And the other um, method is the agent connect, can connect to the master over JNLP. Um, and the fourth option that we get, we're going to talk about, which is the one I recommend, is the agent connecting to the master um, using JLMP via the Swarm plugin. I'm going to get into the details on why that's important later. Some other key important information about this system is that the master can tell an agent to do anything. Um, so it has unlimited freedom to tell that machine to do anything within that user context. Um, something that may also be unexpected is that the agent can also tell the master to do anything. So uh, plugins that are installed, um, they can alter the agent behavior to tell the master to do things, such as print all, all of your credentials in the credential store. They have um, some solutions for that. Um, it's not enabled by default, but there now are administrative monitors to warn you about stuff like that. I'm going to show that a little bit later. The other important thing about Jenkins is that almost all of its functionality comes from plugins. Um, when you have a bare bone Jenkins installation, there's almost no buttons. It really doesn't do anything. Uh, a lot of people never see it in that state, but it really is bare bones, and it's actually getting further that way. With the release of Jenkins 2, um, they actually stripped out all of the built-in plugins from the war, so it actually is even more, and that actually solved a lot of the scalability problems with it. So I want to take a little bit of time, and um, uh, before I get into the deep dive, to just give an overview of what that's going to look like. 
We're going to look at how do you manage jobs uh, with Jenkins um, without using the UI, um, how do you handle credentials, what does the evolution of pipeline look like. Um, so pipeline, I briefly mentioned it, but pipeline is the new uh, way that Jenkins is trying to go. Um, Jenkins is kind of broken up into a set of components for its various jobs and pipeline kind of sidesteps all of that um, and gives you a Groovy DSL to actually define all of your job details. So, and the, I'm gonna finish it up uh, talking about cluster monitoring and maintenance. Um, I can't show everything I wanted to, but I can at least show some of the data for that missing independence. So, managing job components, uh, managing jobs. Um, how do you do that? Uh, before we get into that, I wanna talk about what makes up a job. So some of the components of a job is a wrapper. So every job you define has the ability to have things that can influence the commands that are gonna be executed inside of it, um, but not that are, that are not direct build steps to, in order to complete uh, the particular job. A good example is if you need an environment variable um, to know which CI server to talk to, um, you would place that in a wrapper to tell this job hey, consume this environment variable and then go out to this endpoint. Uh, the other piece is parameters. Um, that's all the user inputs, so all, all, any of the text fields that you see um, in the interface. Uh, triggers, this is how jobs get started. Uh, the two most common ones are a timer trigger or a hook based trigger. SEM, so Jenkins has deep integrations with multiple uh, source control systems. Uh, Git and SVNs are the prime ones. If you're using TFS, um, there's something for that too. Uh, builders, this is all the steps that can occur in a job. And publishers, um, that is all the action that will happen after the build steps complete. So an example is if you run a set of builds, you create an artifact and you want to publish it to like an artifact server, for example, um, you can put that in a post-build step to say, upload this regardless of whether or not the uh, previous step succeeded. All right, so for managing jobs, the best practice I would say is to use the Jenkins Job DSL. Um, it's a plugin that I'm going to demo. Um, it's a plugin that provides a Groovy-based DSL for declaring jobs, and you can even use it to create other C jobs. I'm gonna um, show that as well. So with that, I'm gonna jump into kind of the demo piece. I wanted the talking piece to be kind of short. Um, I wanna kind of touch on all the core concepts I think you need in order to um, manage it. It's gonna be weird with this microphone, but we'll see. Perfect. So before I get started with the demo, are there any questions about any of the Jenkins show? Okay, cool. yeah. All right, so I have um, a Docker Compose that I set up that shows that I just get into sign up some of the meat and potatoes of this. I certainly did. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to get into some kind of core components of Jenkins here. So I have a local Jenkins installation. Um, nothing is on it right now except for this root C job. 
Um, I want to talk about a few pieces of the interface. Um, so I talked earlier about um, all the things that make up Jenkins, all the different pieces. Um, these are kind of the core components. So down here on your left, we can see that we have a set of build agents. Um, in the middle here, we have jobs. Um, up here is kind of new to Jenkins 2.2, actually new in Jenkins 2.2.4. Um, it's an administrative monitor view. Um, so that's the thing I was telling you earlier that kind of watches your Jenkins cluster. And it tells you what's going on and when. Um, shows that I'm logged in, um, and we have all of these other screens. So I want to take a look at the Manage Jenkins screen. Um, this is a screen that a lot of people don't see, uh, but it does exist and it creates a lot. I mean, it has a lot of information. Um, one of the other big components is this Configure System screen. Um, this is where all of your configs go. Um, anything you change inside of this interface uh, will update a file in the file system somewhere. So Jenkins um, stores all of its data in XML. Um, plugins have the ability to alter that behavior, but its default mode is XML. Um, when you're going in and trying to do configuration management with Jenkins, one of the common things to try to do is to manage the XML files directly. Um, you don't want to do that. Um, <laughs> Jenkins will overwrite anything you put there, um, especially if you do it while it's running. Um, so I'm actually going to log into this um, master server just to give an example of um, exactly what's happening behind the scenes. So right here um, we can see that we're in uh, the Jenkins home directory um, on this installations of our Jenkins home. Um, we have a jobs directory here. We do an ls, so it's not colorful so it's not helpful. Um, we have a root C uh, directory here. And inside that root C directory, we have a config.xml. Config.xml is a default descriptor name that Jenkins uses for everything. So we have this job here. I'm going to go ahead and create a new job just to show. And add a build step. running job. Um, now I've mentioned earlier about the red green um, and how Jenkins shows everything as a red green. You may have noticed that when I ran this build it turned blue. Um, well the default installation Jenkins actually uses blue vaults. It doesn't use the red vault. Um, it, uh, it actually requires a plug-in to actually change your balls from blue to red. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> perfect. Uh, so uh, inside of this uh, jobs directory, we can see that that new job we just created is there. Um, um, so if I go into there, the new job, config.xml. Oh, no BI. Oh, okay. All right. So we look at cat, the. Uh, I don't even know what system this is using. Um, but we look at the file, um, and some of those components that I was talking about are going to start showing up here. Um, so you can see that everything is XML. Um, we have a project here at the root, um, and then we start seeing certain components in here. So those different job components that I was speaking about earlier, they're all represented in this config.xml. Um, implementation detail, but Jenkins uses Xtreme to serialize objects uh, from Java into XML files. So what you're going to see in here quite a bit is um, specific class names. Um, and this is highly useful actually when you're trying to um, write Groovy code um, to configure some of these plugins. Um, and the reason for that is it gives you the exact uh, class name that you need um, to be able to configure. So when you're Googling, um, looking at the XML file will go a long way to get you where you need to go. So I want to illustrate this a little bit further. Um, I'm going to take this new job that I just created. I'm going to start adding some additional stuff. Um, so let's tell the discard old builds. Um, let's give it a GitHub project. Okay. Um, I'm going to add in some parameters. This is um, where you define all the inputs. 
one important thing to know about the, uh, the parameters is that anything you define here will automatically be exported um, to any running code as environment variables. Um, so if you need to uh, consume anything, um, environment variables are a recommended way to go. Because you get that functionality for free. Uh, I'm going to add in an SCM. And I probably should point out the difference between the one up there and the one down here. But. Jenkins is very helpful. Um, it will tell you when something is not working. <laughs> Perfect. Um, build triggers. Um, you can also see uh, in the new Jenkins 2.0 world, they also broke down the UI to kind of more uh, represent all the different components that you have to a job. Uh, we can also tell it to uh, trigger, um, to say build periodically, say build every minute. Um, and I'm not going to touch this yet. So now if we cut out this config.xml again, we can kind of see that it has grown quite significantly. Um, so it's clear. Just to... All of those different components um, that are in there um, all tie back to different classes and different plugins. Um, so that discard old builds, um, as you can see, it's this build discarder property. Um, then it gives you the strategy class log, log rotator. So that's an implementation detail in, um, in that plugin. Um, other plugins we can see in here, we can see plugin equals git, github, and they actually give a plugin version here. Um, those environment variables that we define up here um, all work. I want to show really quick um, the behavior of automatic environment variables. So we'll build the parameters. Now we get a when we actually go to run this thing. Hello. Cool. And let's actually add in a failure. So another important thing to know about Jenkins is by default, any of its shell steps um, that it executes, it wants to um, look at the return code to determine whether or not the command succeeded. So you can see, um, build went from blue to red. Okay, all basic stuff. Um, one of the other important aspects that I didn't talk about now is how we actually integrate with um, our agents. So behind the scenes, um, the Jenkins master was talking to a Jenkins agent. So when I read my Docker Compose, um, you can see that it created this um, We have a uh, Docker agent, Docker master. So this um, <clears throat> window over here is kind of a view into all the agents currently connected and where all the jobs are running. I'm gonna show another view, the nodes view. So um, this is um, another tab that kind of just gives uh, details about all the agents. Um, Jenkins cares quite a bit about um, the things that uh, the agents are doing um, and all of the details that it requires to know when it actually is talking to us. So it does things like make sure that the clocks are in sync, um, checking on their free disk space, their swap space, their temp space. Um, it actually has metrics for the response time. So the way that I set this up is for this Jenkins agent to be ephemeral. So if I actually go and do a Docker stop uh, and then kill this agent, we can actually see that this agent just goes away. Um, and that's kind of an important thing because normally that doesn't happen. And this is the primary reason for using that um, uh, plugin, the uh, Swarm plugin. So I'm going to bring it back. And there it goes. And it does the negotiation, it comes back. I'm going to give a quick um, scaling demo. 
So imagine we had metrics saying our Jenkins cluster was running very slowly. Um, we need to add some additional components. Um, we can do document pull scale agent equals to say three. So it's going to create some more agents. And they're automatically going to show up. Cool. Um, now the question is, how does all this happen? Um, these agents are all driven by um, a set of scripts and a, kind of a set a, of processes um, that all work. Um, so I kind of want to show this Docker file um, to kind of illustrate all the all the uh, components that's needed to create a Jenkins agent. Uh, one of the important pieces I want to talk about is the lack of the stuff that you're not going to see here. Um, so in order for this um, Jenkins agent um, to come in service, um, literally all we have to do is grab a couple of jars um, from the internet. Um, the Swarm client is uh, the plugin, um, and then we have um, another script um, that I created that will actually go and do uh, the core pieces. Um, so Jenkins has the ability to expose a set of uh, endpoints through its plugin mechanisms. Um, I'm just going to step through this script real quick just to kind of give a brief um, understanding of what it's doing. So the first thing the script does, it, it says, wait for the master to become available on port 8080. Um, after it becomes available, um, do a loop on the login page and wait for 200. After that, um, go into this app directory um, and then download some of these jars from the master. Um, after it does that, um, we get into one of our other uh, key points at the top is credentials. Um, so it actually will go and in order to talk to the master, it uses an API token, um, which is generated on its um, user screen. Um, so if we go back here, we go to people, um, we go to admin, um, which is me, uh, we hit configure, and then we hit show API token, uh, we get an API token here. Jenkins needs this API token um, in order to be able to connect an agent. So this is how the authentication is working. If you look back at my script, um, you're going to see here that I'm actually using the Jenkins CLI um, to retrieve um, those credentials. So using the Jenkins CLI, you actually have the ability to um, execute ad hoc Ruby scripts, uh, which is super cool. Um, I'm going to actually go into the agent and show that. So if we look at this jar, uh, which we can retrieve from the master, we saw that curl here. Um, any Jenkins agent you find on the internet is going to expose this JNLP uh, jars um, and then this Jenkins CLI. Um, this Jenkins CLI jar is uh, the version that was coded to go with this particular instance of Jenkins. Um, you can use it. Um, usually it's not required for compatibility. Um, one that is important is this uh, slate.jar though. Um, I probably should make a, a point to mention um, the terminology um, that Jenkins had used before the word agent was slave. Um, so you're going to see a lot of um, inconsistency between, in the plugin world um, and the new world um, as a transition. There was a huge PR that they had out saying, get rid of the word uh, slave. We don't like it. Um, so they made um, a huge PR, replaced it everywhere except all the plugins and some of the core pieces like remoting. Um, so if you see slave or agent, they're interchangeable. Um, the PC term to use today is agent. <laughs> All right. Um, so I'm going to show exactly what this Jenkins CLI can do. Um, just make sure that it works first. Cool. It does. Um, the error means it's working. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, uh, the Jenkins CLI has the same defaults. Um, it knows to read um, where it's connecting to from an environment variable. Uh, so if we dump out this END, uh, we have a Jenkins URL right there. 
Um, so we're going to say java-jar, gcli.jar-i, um, and we're actually going to give it a pem file. Um, and let's just run that. So as soon as you do that, um, Jake is going to say, um, you didn't give me a command. What do you want to do? Um, and it's going to print out all the things that it can do. Um, one of the cool things about this CLI is that um, the CLI commands can be um, enhanced by plugins. So if plugins exposes any of their functionality over um, the CLI, it's immediately available. So one of the important ones I want to show is who am I? Um, it's always a good one to get started. Um, and then another one is uh, Groovy. So you can actually tell it to execute a particular Groovy, Groovy script, or you can actually open up a Groovy console, which is super powerful. Um, but also super dangerous. Groovy credentials.groovy. So I'm gonna just tell it to call um, this command with this script. So what that did was it went and executed this code, uh, snip it directly on the master. Um, and um, this println is also part of it. Um, and it's just printing out the um, user and token um, as a string. And I'm using that inside of my script to just say, hey, I need an API token. You might be wondering, like, if you already have an SSHT, why are you doing all this junk? Just use that. Um, unfortunately, the remoting API does not support authentication using SSH or client certificates or anything else that's cool. Um, so it can only do API tokens. So you have to do workarounds like this. And this is kind of that real world nature that I want to kind of hit upon is that um, Jenkins, um, although it's very mature, it still has a long way to go. And with that long way to go, um, the only way it gets there is by people going and doing the stuff. I'm gonna show some PRs that I have open with uh, some of these plugins that kind of give examples of how they just randomly break stuff and you have to go fix it. All right, so that's the uh, credential script. Um, after it finds that, get that token, um, it exports it and then it calls um, the Java. Um, you give it a couple of variables. Um, you give it that swarm jar and you give it that slave jar um, and then you give it the swarm client. Um, and then it will connect. Um, and this is how you form an um, ad hoc cluster. Um, one of the other features of this plugin is that it can actually do its discovery via UDP broadcast, um, which will allow you to get rid of that secret exchange because um, it will say, hey, I'm over here listening um, for UDP broadcast. Anything that sends out a request, I will send back it, its own individual credentials. Um, that doesn't work in places like AWS, um, where uh, multicast doesn't work. Um, so you have to do stuff like this where you're passing in um, URLs um, and tokens. All right, oops, let me know the photos. All right. <laughs> All right, so I showed that. Um, let me actually go and talk a little bit about the API. Um, so Jenkins um, has a model um, so um, that it uses to kind of define everything. Everything it defines has a set of properties um, that is serializable. Um, so part of the reason this is important is because every URL that you hit in Jenkins will be pointing at some form of model somewhere. So almost anywhere you go inside of Jenkins, you can type slash API slash XML. Um, and you can get XML representation of whatever you're looking at. Um, so in this case, we're looking at um, um, Hudson.model.hudson, uh, which is the main interface. But where it gets interesting is if we go to a job, we can do the same thing. So we can get the XML definition for this job, and we can also get some key details about that job, like the last build, um, the last build was completed, um, items like that. You can also get any of the parameter definitions um, you can get URLs. Um, you can also go down to a specific bill and do that same thing. So that information you just got was about the um, job itself. Um, this is going to be about the last bill that we're in. Um, this is one of those areas where if you're not careful, secrets can certainly leak. Uh, because a lot of people don't know that these endpoints exist. Um, and if you're not 
um, protecting your secrets by masking them somehow or using um, specific plugins to handle it, um, you can get in trouble. All right. So um, now that I gave a brief um, overview of that, I'm going to jump into the job DSL. Um, are there any questions about any of that random stuff? But you know, with your mask, the master, can it just like push, push the exact key in like a credential store or something like that? And you can discover it that way? You certainly can. So, um, one of the things, uh, one of the reasons why I do it this way um, by using the pre shared SSH key um, is that every time you spin up a fresh Jenkins instance, um, it generates a new um, salt uh, for any secret that it uses. So if you had any API tokens over there before, um, they're no longer valid because you have a new salt. Um, the only way to get around that is by uh, backing up like the Jenkins home directory, um, and um, or you can get around it by managing your API uh, users through the Groovy. Um, I don't do it that way um, because it hasn't been reliable, um, but the SSH key way um, has. Um, so um, another reason why I'm showing it this way is um, not every environment um, is set up in such a way where um, all of the agents have the same level of connectivity to um, the same things that the master has. Um, so an example is if you have one master in like a prod account, um, and then you have like four development account, uh, de uh, development stage test account, they're all connecting up to this one master. Um, there's no guarantee they can connect to the same um, secret store. Um, so there's just something you have to coordinate, but you certainly can um, work around and figure out ways to make it work. Um, the challenge becomes trying to get that secret into those environments with Jenkins living in one place. Without its agents, it really doesn't do anything. Um, it certainly has capabilities, um, but um, one of the recommendations to not have executors on your master, um, simply because you can do stuff like disabling security. Um, truth be told, you can do that without executors on your master. But, um, it's very, it's much easier to do that um, if your master has an executor. So usually your master is executorless. Any other questions? Did that answer your question? Yeah. Perfect. All right. So C jobs, uh, Jenkins job DSL. Um, so we have this job here. Um, I kind of want to show it just disappeared. So I'm going to go and roll my Jenkins server. Jenkins is gone. Perfect. Actually, Jenkins might still be there. Thanks to Docker. So, as you can see, the job is gone now. Um, but the job that's not gone is my root C job. Um, and part of the reason for that is I persisted that in the um, uh, Jenkins home. Um, but more importantly, um, this job is defined in code. Um, so even if this code dis uh, job disappeared, I have a way to automatically bring it back. Um, it's actually stored in Git. Um, so I'm actually going to run this job, just to kind of give an example of the job DSL. So the job DSL, all it's, um, goal in life is to create your jobs and manage them for you. Um, perfect use case for it if you have a lot of jobs and do a lot of the same things. Um, it is very good at giving you a Ruby DSL to iterate over that. So we can see here, I just ran that job, it created two other jobs. It created a Gradle C job and a Docker C job. Um, kind of like Inception. Um, but as we see here, um, we have a Docker C um, that it was just created. I'm actually going to show what this job looks like. This is the root C, the one that just created that job. So I have this pointing to GitHub right now. Um, I'm saying um, uh, pull down the master branch um, and load this uh, C job script from the file system. Um, under advanced, I don't know why it's under advanced, um, they have an additional class path option. 
So it also has the ability to load uh, Groovy code. Um, so if you want to hit the GitHub APIs directly, um, you can do that. Um, instead of like uh, doing exactly what I'm about to show, um, which is um, defining a list of repositories in your uh, DSL. So if I open up the c.groovy, um, this is what it looks like. Um, so we have a list of jobs, hard-coded, um, that will come back um, anytime we run this job. Um, I'm just gonna do a quick illustration to show like what it would take to add in a whole new set of jobs. Actually, I'm gonna do that later. Um, well, we can see we have Gradle and we have Docker. Um, and all it has in here is the uh, DSL bits, um, which uh, the high level um, for the um, Jinky Job DSL is the job, um, which will by default create a freestyle job. Um, and then you give it a name, and then you give it a configuration. In this case, I'm saying create me a job that is pointing to Git um, using these details. And in that job, I want it to um, uh, process job DSLs. So these steps are now analogous to the builders um, that I was talking about earlier. All right. So now that we saw that, I'm gonna go back to this Docker job, Docker seed, let's run this one. See what happens. Hopefully it doesn't fail. All right. Cool. So this um, Docker job um, just ran and it created um, three more jobs. Um, so we have repo one master, repo two master, repo three master. Um, and the way that I define this uh, docker.groovy is by setting up a class for it. So if we go to this class, um, we will kind of see um, what the details uh, look like. And I have reference links to all this stuff. I'm going to push all this stuff up to GitHub so you don't have to consume it all now. Um, I, like I said earlier, I just want you to get the core concepts and move forward with that. So inside of here, um, we can kind of see that um, we have this build method. Um, and we can kind of start seeing the components that we brought together. So we have a folder um, that we created called Docker. Inside of Docker, we created another folder. Um, and then after that, we actually created a job. So we have this DSL factory that pipeline job, um, talking about job types a little bit. Um, pipeline jobs are uh, the new Groovy based DSL ones. Freestyle jobs are the one that you're probably more accustomed to. Um, and inside of here, this definition um, is all specific to the um, way that the pipeline plugin is set up and defined. I actually want to show the um, API docs for it. I'll show that in a little bit. Um, but inside of here, we see we have a script. Uh, we put this pipeline code in there. Um, this pipeline code is um, just a, another groovy script. I'm going to break down exactly what this script is doing in a second. So we created those three jobs. Um, we're here. Um, let's go to repo one master. I'm going to build this job. All right, so the new pipeline DSL goodness. Um, so it gives you a pretty view um, and a cap capability of splitting all of your jobs into stages. Um, each one of your um, stages um, has a set of logs associated with it. So um, for this particular build, um, all I did was check out a Docker file, um, do a Docker build on it, and then I ran a, um, a command to sort of test to make sure that it was working. So inside of here, I'm going to show the pipeline code. And actually, let's just go to configure. Hey, question for you. Yes. So in order to use the job, you can create the, the pipeline and everything like for it in terms of scripts. Like, yep. Would you recommend like, one process to the other there? If you can kind of like, load it through some repo and get like, other scripts and then find the job to trigger the pipeline? Are you talking about the CPS Global Library stuff? Yeah. Like,
So um, the question is surrounding um, doing it this way versus the new pipeline way. So the pipeline way, um, just to talk about it briefly, is um, it is very similar to um, Travis CI um, or drone um, as far as its definition. Um, so the way it works is you drop a file in your repo. Um, it will define all of your steps. Um, and then you can actually build, um, you can actually just have um, Jenkins scan your organization, look through those Jenkins files, um, and actually uh, construct all of your builds um, that way. Um, is that what you're talking about? Just to make sure. Yeah. Yeah, and that's exactly what this is doing as well. Um, some of the pieces are kind of hard to see, but all of these scripts are coming from like a, another Git repository. So that C job that I uh, um, showed, um, it was just loading a um, Groovy file from another um, from its GitHub GitHub repository and executing it. Um, so um, to talk briefly about uh, why um, I haven't jumped on Jenkins files yet. Um, it's simply because the amount of code reuse is very limited with it. Um, so they do have a mechanism um, for that, the CPS Global Library, um, but it's very uh, limited in what it can do um, and the way that you have to share them um, and the permissions that you need to actually use those scripts um, kind of exceed um, a level that I was comfortable with. Um, so to use a shared script, you need run script permission, which pretty much gives you the ability to do it. So you need trusted people um, making those shared libraries. Um, and this way, um, I don't have to use any Jenkins files and I don't have to modify my repositories. Um, and I can just add a list of repositories and just have it scan it. I can also do uh, some of the same functionality that the uh, pipeline uh, plugin, or uh, the GitHub branch source plugin does. Uh, scanning repositories and creating a list of jobs from there. So the future is certainly using Jenkins files everywhere. I just don't think they're there yet. Um, and one thing I forgot to mention about um, this job as well um, is that there are serious compatibility problems with existing plugins using pipeline jobs. Um, and the way that you usually work around that is by wrapping it in a freestyle job. So this is um, that script that the pipeline um, just executed. Um, so um, just to go line by line, since it's a pretty simple script, um, this node um, will actually go and allocate an agent um, and a workspace um, with this label. This checkout command here will, is what's actually going and doing the um, checkout from SCM. Um, then the stage just creates that pretty view that you saw. Um, then we do this um, docker.build. Um, then we create another stage. And finally we go and we take that image that was created from this docker.build. Um, we call that inside, which will spin up a Docker container um, and run this command inside of it. So I'm kind of using some of the functionality on Jenkins just to give me a simple testing harness. Um, I'm just calling bash dash dash version and grepping for this. Grep, if it doesn't find a match, it will exit one. Um, if it finds a match, it will exit zero. Um, so looking at this again, we can see that we're all green all the way down. We can actually see the actual command that it ran. It ran bash uh, dash dash version, that actually happened. I'm gonna go and configure this job and change this just to make it fail. Um, so one of the mechanisms I also wanted to talk about, holy oh, um, One of the mechanisms I wanted to talk about too was how um, this Jenkins server is actually being configured. Um, so you see um, certain things um, installed, like plugins. So all of this stuff is installed, and some of it's configured. How did that happen? So Jenkins has a sure. Oh, okay. 
Yeah, we can certainly break a moment's stem. But if it's last longer. If you're on the stem? Yeah. Okay. Cool. Oh, cool. Um, so, to kind of illustrate how um, this Jenkins server is configured, uh, which is kind of the most important part, is um, to kind of look into its Groovy um, hook loading mechanism. So if we look at this um, startup script, we can see inside of this um, message is saying that it's executing um, these particular scripts. So it's executing var jenkins home init.groovy.d tcp um, slave agent port. Um, and we can find other examples of this. Um, we can also see it's creating this user admin. Um, I'm going to show um, very quickly uh, what that um, admin looks like. So this is an example of how to configure um, Jenkins using Groovy. Um, and to get this code, um, there's kind of a lot of resources out on the internet. Um, so if you go look at different cookbooks or any of the puppet modules or any of those things, a lot of them rely on actually executing um, configura configuration management by hitting the uh, Jenkins API. Um, this mechanism I like a little bit better um, because you can actually drop in the files, um, you can take a snapshot of the image, and then you don't need your configuration management software continuously running. Um, so I defined some, uh, some config in here. Um, the agent port um, we have here, um, we have executors, um, and then we have users. And down here, I'm just going to say um, execute all these uh, commands in order to do these things. Um, then you can print messages in the log, like I did, creating user and then the username. Um, and then it will actually go and uh, create and save uh, those particular users. So the way that I would suggest doing it is by using that mechanism. So inside this um, var jingatome init.groovy.d, um, it will literally load any file that you put in here and execute their code as Jenkins is starting. Um, so I have a couple different pieces in there um, set up for actually managing and configuring. Um, but really, realistically, you have to do this for all of your um, items. Um, two other pieces I just wanted to show very quickly, because um, I'm kind of way over time, um, is uh, the Jenkins thread dump. Um, so any Jenkins server, anytime it starts acting up, um, the way that the master um, keeps communication with all of the uh, agents is by creating a Java thread for it. Um, so usually if you have like an agent that's acting up, um, you can do go to this thread dump URL, um, and you can kind of see exactly what agent is doing what and where. So you can see on the master, um, we're doing this. We're not running anything on any of the agents, but let me do this. So you can see on here that um, you can see executor number two um, is doing this particular thing. Um, and um, unfortunately, it does sleep, so you can't see exactly what it's doing because it's just waiting. Um, but if it was actually executing some work, um, you kind of see um, things that it was actually doing at that given point in time. I want to take a quick um, look at metrics. Um, So the Jacob Metrics plugin gives you uh, the ability to uh, publish any metrics that you have um, 
to a graphite server. Um, so part of the demo I wanted to do was showing what all the pretty graphs look like um, that came from Jenkins, but um, that didn't work out. Um, so I'm just showing the data. Um, so you can get all of this data um, from here. Um, the other way that it can actually just ship it, so inside of your configure screen, you can actually just ship um, your metrics to a graphite server. Um, but let's say you had needed a, um, you had a monitoring server that can only talk to it um, over HTTP. Um, that would be a reliable option for actually getting that data. So I'm over time. Um, is there anything specific that I did not show that you want me to talk about? Yeah, so there's actually, you doing that through the Groovy is one way, but you actually have to do um, two things. Um, so inside of my Docker file um, we have here, I'm actually doing that. The trick to that is creating these two files on the file system. Um, and then once you do that, the wizard will go away. Of course, it's so weird. Yeah, it's super weird. Um, and there's a uh, dash D argument to make the wizard go away. Um, but somebody filed a bug saying that it doesn't work. Um, and the solution was um, they opened another issue that said, make the disabled wizard actually disable the wizard. Um, <laughs> and they never got to it. So this is the way, this is the way to do it. Um, so put in that chicken version inside of this file. Um, so the wizard, when you first spin it up, if it's a new install, it's gonna say one thing. Um, if it detects a new version, it's gonna give you another wizard. Um, so one way you can work around that, if you're not doing uh, immutable servers um, and you're actually upgrading the Jenkins War uh, Live, um, is you can make this file read-only um, and Jenkins will just throw an exception and it will move on. So it certainly works. Yeah, I'm going to push to GitHub. I, uh, Started reorganizing when my AWS stuff didn't work. Um, I'm gonna push it out probably later tonight or tomorrow. Um, I have all my CloudFormation stuff here too. It, it was just a mess. Um, but yeah, I'm gonna push out all this stuff. Um, kind of, I have tons of links. Actually, I don't know that. Um, I have tons of links here. Um, don't read the other stuff. Um, I, have, <laughs> I have tons of links here and references that I plan on um, actually. I got actually make sure. Okay, cool. Um, <laughs> um, so um, I'm gonna post out like the outline, uh, what I actually wanted to talk about, um, and links to all of the kind of supporting material. Um, it uh, kind of explains everything, but the, if I had to say anything, um, make sure you use the init.ruby.id mechanism and push your metrics to graphite. Um, so you can actually alert and monitor on them. Oh, and the thing I kind of glossed over was the scaling. Um, I just did it really fast. Um, but by default, if you install Jenkins and you try to do exactly what I did with that agent scale equals whatever, um, it will fail horribly. Um, so follow this um, pattern that I laid out um, and it should work out great. So that Swarm plugin is 100% necessary for the automated deregistration. Um, and the automated registration and the uh, unique uh, no name pieces. I didn't talk about credentials. That's a problem. <laughs>